The world of video games is definitely not short of any scandals, that's for sure. I mean, just look online any day of the week. But this has been going on for a long time. There are scandals that go as far back as to the 1970s. So today, let's talk about 10 video game scandals you probably forgot about. Starting off with number 10, a lot of people don't really talk about it, especially the publisher themselves, uh, but it's Sega's failures. Sega had a string of bad luck for a long time, going from console manufacturer to publisher that had some missteps even with their games. I mean, think about it. We had the Sega Saturn and then the Dreamcast, which put things in the bin for Sega for quite a while. But interestingly enough, there's a lot more behind the scenes to it. Shout out to the They Create Worlds podcast. This is one of those deep, long-form podcasts that is created by actual professionals with college degrees and law degrees, and essentially, they break down the failures of Sega, and specifically, the infighting within Sega on the Japanese side. With all the research to the Japanese perspectives here, there's a lot to it, and it's absolutely fascinating. The downfall of Sega, when it was at its highest highs in the 90s, of course, they had ambitions to grow, become more professional, and franchise out into movies, multiple multimedia, theme parks, and really become their own version of Disney. Now to grow in this crazy way, they would have to spend tons and tons of money. And apparently that led to a lot of disagreement internally uh, in terms of seeking out outside investors and a possible merger first with Bandai, which that fell through and then top leadership dropped off. And then it continued for a long time with Sammy, primarily a pachinko manufacturer. And then eventually there was apparently plans to merge with Namco in the early 2000s and then more people left and there was no agreement there. And then by 2004, the Sammy merger finally went through and then there you have Sega Sammy Holdings. There was apparently for many years, a lot of drama leading up to the Sammy merger thing with so many people internally not wanting to do it, but eventually, they all gave in. Sega had a lot of oopsies in the late 90s, early 2000s. Thankfully today, Sega's pretty cool. I mean, they're making games, they're doing their thing. They pretty much know their lane at this point, but there was a lot of stuff going on back in the day. And shout out to the They Create Worlds podcast for really breaking this down in a good way. We will link that in the description down below. Next over at number nine, uh, people forget that the loading screen game was patented. So some of you might not remember, but loading screens often lasted for a really long time. And Namco of all companies actually had a patent for the video game loading screen mini game. Essentially playing tiny little video games, just quick little things to keep your mind busy while you wait for the real proper game to finish loading. According to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, this was patented in 1998, specifically as a method for quote unquote, avoiding an unnecessary wasted of time in a game, and these were called auxiliary games. Yes, Namco technically had like a legal ownership over little busy mini games for almost 20 years. Thankfully, this patent did expire in 2015, and it led to the conversation around patenting certain ideas in the realm of software. It is definitely a contentious topic, and specifically in the gaming world for certain ideas. I mean, we talk about Warner Brothers patenting the Nemesis system from the Shadow of Mordor games. That would be a great idea to use in other video games, but like this is an ongoing thing, but at the very least, the loading screen thing is over and done with, thankfully, but gaming has really kind of always had, and I quote, a dubious patent history, according to Ars Technica. So things like this are probably gonna still pop up here and there, but the loading screen mini game was a wild one. Next over at number eight, Driver 3 released and was an absolute mess. We've talked about Driver before a lot on, the, on this channel. I call it Driv 3R because that's how it was spelled. There's a lot of nostalgia for that game for some of us, but the game wasn't actually that great. But believe it or not, it actually released in a horrifically buggy state. Shout out to the YouTuber Larry Bundy Jr. for doing some great videos breaking down a lot of this. There was a lot of drama behind Driver 3 with Atari wanting to get this thing out the door after they're burning so much money, millions and millions of dollars on it for years and years. When it came down to it needing about six more months of polish, they had to just get it out the door. And that resulted in an incredibly glitchy, 
messy game that ultimately ended up failing. It needed to sell a couple of million units to break even, and it barely managed to squeak out like a million. And along with this, there's some internal issues with Atari, external issues with some video game magazines and how this was covered. Ultimately, just a big old mess for a series that we actually still really like and thankfully did go on to survive for a little while. A lot of it was Atari and the developer reflections really scrambling to keep up after the success of Grand Theft Auto 3 and Vice City. They were in the middle of making Driver 3, which was humble in comparison. Graphically, it looked a lot more realistic, but Grand Theft Auto at that point had really revolutionized the open world driving action game. And unfortunately, Driver 3 fell victim to Rockstar's success, and it was absolutely brutal. Next over at number seven, uh, the Kojima drama. Now, the hardcore gaming community and Metal Gear fans in particular definitely haven't forgotten about this one, but really it's all the details and the slow burn of this one that is just tucked away in video game history books. But this went on for a while. Hideo Kojima had like a 30 year partnership with Konami and it all broke down over the course of Metal Gear Solid 5, Ground Zeroes and Phantom Pain development. You probably know the big picture at this point, Hideo Kojima and Kojima Productions developed Metal Gear Solid games that were published by Konami, but things broke down and eventually Konami kicked him to the curb while also erasing his name from the box art of the Metal Gear Solid. Like it usually always says a Hideo Kojima game for Metal Gear Solid 5 Phantom Pain. And when that released, ugh, that was taken off and people were pissed. Leading up to that, Konami had done some corporate restructuring and the way things were shaking out, it sounded like Konami and Kojima were starting to break up, but they came out with a joint statement saying, hey, I'm Hideo Kojima. I'm still 100% committed to the Phantom Pain, blah, 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 blah. But didn't really say anything about when they were leaving. And sure enough, according to reports, Kojima Productions was reduced to like contract staff, Kojima himself, uh, and they lost a lot of access to emails and just normal corporate things. And were basically just waiting around for their contracts to expire. And essentially that's what happened because Hideo Kojima and his team were out and they eventually went on to found their own new independent Kojima Productions. But along with that is just all the damage left in its wake. Obviously all the team members that worked under Hideo Kojima had to struggle with all of this. They probably weren't as wealthy as Hideo himself. Also the fact that there was like a whole Los Angeles offshoot of Kojima Productions set up that was eventually restructured and renamed. And also the people that were working on Silent Hills and PT, including Guillermo del Toro, which was also tossed to the curb. Konami really apparently went scorched earth with all of this as leadership changed at the top and they wanted to shift to making mobile games and stuff. Really, they haven't recovered since people really forget about Konami. They're starting to come back with little things here and there, but but at the very least, thankfully, Hideo Kojima is still out there making games, just definitely not with Konami. Pretty much everybody but Konami at this point. Jumping over to number six with another massive historic video game breakup, it's Jason West and Vince Sampella, who you may forget were really the video game rock stars for a while as co-founders of Infinity Ward, absolutely crushing it with the original Call of Duty games, all the way up to the original Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Then, seemingly, a very sudden breakup with Activision. It resulted in years of lawsuits back and forth, countersuits between the parties, with Activision saying that Jason West and Vince Pella were hard to work with, and that there had been insubordination and breach of duties and all this stuff. And then on Vince Pella and Jason West's side, they claim that Activision just didn't want to pay them anymore. Their salaries, their bonuses, because they were co-founders of the company, ballooned to so much that Activision was trying to skirt around that. There was a lot to it. We'll link a Kotaku article that breaks it down, but essentially, internally, it seemed like there was a lot of backstabbing and corporate bad guy stuff, but ultimately, I'd say it resulted in a net positive because Jason West and Vince Zampella went on to co-found and form Respawn Entertainment. Respawn, who is now responsible for stuff like Apex Legends, of course, the mega hit, uh, the awesome and underrated Titanfall 2, and now the big Star Wars Jedi games arguably some of the better modern Star Wars games. There are pages and pages of lawsuits between these two parties, like I said, the back and forth, but at the very least, at least we got Titanfall out of it. We just really like Titanfall, but hey. 
Next over at number five, hey, you remember the latest round of physical media wars? It was Blu-ray versus HD DVD. I haven't said the words HD DVD out loud since that was a thing. Essentially, Blu-ray won out, as you can probably tell. And a big part of this was thanks to Sony's tactical move of including a Blu-ray player in the PlayStation 3. Obviously, the massive storage capacity upgrade for a Blu-ray disc was a boon for PlayStation 3 game development, but it also meant that anybody who had an expensive PlayStation 3 also automatically had a Blu-ray player. And with PlayStation selling a lot of PlayStations, apparently this really helped get them over the line. Toshiba's HD DVD is no more. I definitely have at least one in a closet somewhere, but it's probably just a glorified coaster at this point. Now over at number four, speaking of disc drives and Sony, Nintendo versus Sony. Yeah, in the early 90s, Nintendo wanted to do a sick collab. They joined up with Sony to create a Super Nintendo with a disk drive. Apparently, Nintendo very early on got paranoid that Sony was using this to kind of jump into video games. And that was apparently definitely the case because Nintendo was very quick to kick Sony to the curb pretty soon after revealing this thing. And with that partnership abruptly ended, Sony was absolutely pissed. Ken Kutaragi at the time, of course, did have plans to break into the video game world and hoping Nintendo would be the way to do it. But after this, out of spite, they created Sony Interactive Entertainment and the rest is history. Nintendo, by being old fashioned, aggressive Nintendo, cutting Sony out of a proposed partnership very quickly, ended up creating one of their own worst enemies. Hey, the more competition, the better, but damn Nintendo, you really cut your nose off to spite your face on that one. Next over at number three, Horse Armor. Horse Armor, I will never forget Horse Armor. The DLC that was essentially the spark that lit the fuse that started the fire. Whether or not you remember this, uh, the Elder Scrolls Oblivion had its first paid DLC in the form of a little cosmetic, just armor for your horse. Really nice, beautiful elven armor to be exact. And this was in 2006. It was a horse armor pack actually with a couple of horse armors and they would give your horses little extra attributes, but it amounted to like two US dollars. And to quote Polygon, horse armor was mocked. We definitely mocked it. We all made fun of it, but it launched a billion dollar digital cosmetic industry. I mean, think about the massive marketplace out there for Counter-Strike skins to just DLC and piecemeal content added on in games. People get mad at Bethesda for a lot of things in this day and age, some rightfully so, but not enough people are mad at them for essentially inventing DLC. I know they didn't, like it was definitely around a little bit before, but they definitely pioneered and popularized it with this horse armor. Apparently the horse armor, as funny as we thought it was, sold well enough for this trend to continue up until this day. Now down at number two, Billy Mitchell, the famous world record holder for the Donkey Kong high score uh, has been embroiled in drama for years and years and allegations of cheating. He was actually stripped of his Donkey Kong high score record. And it has come up in the news multiple times over the course of many years because different organizations have stripped him of that title. Now, this stuff honestly gets super technical and it's kind of hard to explain. Frankly, I think it's a little boring, but a lot of it is centered around emulation, fact versus fiction, and hard to find truths. But ultimately, Billy Mitchell has been embroiled in scandals for many, many years at this point. Lawsuits, he said, she said, all that stuff. It is a very interesting story when you dive deep into it, but it is one that is often forgotten, specifically for the younger generations that don't find this stuff as cool. It is still a bombshell of a thing to this day. Now down at number one, the creation of third party video game publishers can essentially be credited to Activision and Atari, really specifically Atari's bad decisions. So back in the day, in the 70s, it was like the console manufacturers also made the games. That was it, it was a simple industry. People just thought that's how it was gonna be. It kind of made sense, but the creators of those games working for Atari found themselves frustrated more and more for not getting credit for making the games. They were just games made by Atari, that's it. So after a corporate merger in the 70s when Nolan Bushnell sold it, a lot of the big developers decided to go out and form their own studio and create and publish their own games on game cartridges for Atari systems. 
This studio that they founded was called none other than Activision, a studio that spitefully apparently also started with an A and came up alphabetically before Atari. And then the rest is history. That was like an unheard of thing at the time, but they were essentially one of the first third party video game publishers and developers. Now they've gone on today to be like one of the biggest. It's crazy how history works. This was a scandal that ultimately changed the video game industry forever. And really, these were 10 video game scandals that some people forget, but are absolutely fascinating. If you've got any more, we'd love to hear yours in the comments, but let us know what you think about any of this stuff. There's a lot more facts to them, so if you wanna read up, of course, everything will be linked in the description down below. If you like this video though, and you like us talking video games every day with you, clicking the like button's all you gotta do. It really helps us out. But if you're new, consider subscribing, maybe hitting that notification bell, because we put out videos every single day. But as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.